my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about healing our intimacy disorders, unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first ourselves and then others. Every episode, we will talk about advice you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow in your self-worth. I'm Sheena Lachey, Love Addiction Coach and Trauma Specialist. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. So in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about a very requested topic. It's actually been more requested behind the scenes whenever I'm talking about no contact. So for those of you who don't know, I teach a no contact process that is based on your healing as a love addict. When most of us think about no contact, we automatically know that that usually means blocking someone and not talking to them for a while, you know, kind of removing access. But I teach about no contact being a full detox healing process that is multiple steps. That's not really even focused on the person as a whole, but more focused on the trauma that brought you into this place, your patterns and your habits around this person. What makes it hard for you to let go of this trauma bond and the places in your heart that this is serving, right? So as I've taught this over the years, one question that comes up often is, what do you do if you need to go into no contact with someone that you're co-parenting with? Right. So especially the way that I teach this, I teach this to do no contact for 90 days to just really focus and do this deep dive on this healing process for yourself and learn how to put your focus on yourself for 90 days so that you can get clarity on whether or not you do want to stay with this person, whether or not you do want to have a final closure conversation with them that's actually going to go somewhere and not make you feel still as confused or connected to them as before whether or not you do want to reconcile with them, but now you're going to reconcile from a place of wholeness and a place of more clarity with what you want, right? And it's not out of fear. It's not out of anxiety. It's not out of a trauma bond. And that you can't engage with them and have them be around you and you not immediately go into a very emotional state, whether or not they see that or not. But on the inside, do I get filled with anxiety, with longing, with rage, (laughs) with disappointment, with betrayal, with hurt? with joy or a mixture of any of those, you know, for you to get to a place of real neutrality and to be able to breathe again and live your life. As I've taught about the importance of doing that, especially as you heal from love addiction, I constantly get questions about, well, what happens? How do I do that if I'm co-parenting with a person? If I'm having to raise minor children with them that requires us to communicate, to keep these little people alive, to, to make sure that they have everything that they need. So in today's episode, that is what I'm going to talk about, how to do a co-parenting dynamic if or when you are in a no contact healing process from your co-parent for at least 90 days. My disclaimer here is I'm going to be talking about doing some tips and some steps about five, maybe there'll be a bonus one, but this is not going to be for relationships where there is the presence of physical domestic violence. Because some of the things that I'm going to be sharing, even though they're related to being empowering, even though they're related to finding what works best for you, if there is a threat of physical violence against you or your children, there may be some things that you can't implement or you need to have extra support if you're considering implementing them because of the risk and the danger. So that is my disclaimer to please supplement whatever I may say here with the support, advice, leadership, caseworking of folks from your local domestic violence shelter the National Domestic Violence Hotline, your therapist, the people in your community that can help keep you safe. But yes, this podcast episode is for anyone who relates to love addiction and love avoidance and you need to go into no contact with someone who's triggering those trauma bonds that you share little people together. So that's it. Let's go ahead and jump on in. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Before we get started, let's take a small break to say thank you to this week's sponsors. This episode is sponsored by ByHeart. ByHeart is an infant nutrition company built from the ground up to deliver real innovation on behalf of babies and parents. ByHeart is made with certified clean ingredients. Plus, it has no soy, corn syrup, GMOs, or palm oil. ByHeart features a patented protein blend that gets closest to breast milk. Their blend includes the most abundant protein found in breast milk. 
alpha-lac, as well as lactoferrin, the number one protein found in colostrum, along with broken down, partially hydrolyzed proteins. Byheart is the only U.S.-made infant formula with globally sourced ingredients to use organic grass-fed whole milk, not skim. Curious about Byheart? Redeem your welcome offer at byheart.com slash podcast with code BGH for a limited time. Additional terms and conditions apply. All righty. So like I said, I teach no contact as a 90 day healing tool for us to break the cycle of love addiction. So many people will try to get out of their patterns of their intimacy disorders and they're kind of going the line between holding on to relationships and trying to stay their friends and trying to, you know, or trying to not talk to them and move on, but they're unaware of the ways that they are still reinforcing those trauma bonds by having some type of contact with them. And so that's what the no contact process is about. You can learn more about that by looking at our no contact and detox support kit that walks you through this process for 90 days and gives you specific tasks to do every single 30 days so that you can get grounded, get cleared, and move on. So within that process, though, if you are co-parenting with little people, you can't really block them. You can't really decide, I'm just going to be indifferent towards their experience. You will have contact with them that may trigger all the things that kick up all of your emotions and the reason why you had to go into no contact in the first place. So I'm going to give you some guidelines and some things to keep in mind if you are trying to take 90 days away from this situation, okay? So I'm going to share something from the very top that is going to be kind of an overarching experience that I want you to be your overall goal. And maybe everything else are just umbrella steps underneath. But your overall goal is to get to a place where you are completely neutral and unbothered by what this person does neutral and unbothered by what this person does. I think many of us, especially those of us who have our own avoidance streaks within ourselves, we might not be as emotionally attached to ourselves, just to be honest, because we're very good at compartmentalizing or repressing our emotions and feelings. You may be the type of person that if something happens to you and someone's asking you, okay, well, what do you feel? It might be hard for you to say what those emotions are at first. If you are recognizing what it is that you feel, if I were to say, okay, you feel sad, how do you know you feel sad? You might tell me what some thoughts that you have. But if I say, okay, well, what do you feel in your body? How does your body know that it's sad? Where do you feel it? You might look at me like I'm crazy or be like, or just kind of be frozen or say, I feel numb. Even though if I physically look at you, I can see that now you're slumped over. I can see that you're kind of tearing up again. I can see how you're starting to hold your arms. You know, your body is reacting to the feelings, but you don't really have any connection to it. So sometimes if that type of energy or that type of experience is what we are connected to, if you hear someone say to be unbothered and to be neutral about them, for you, that might be like, okay, that's what I've already been doing. Like, I'm good with that. Like, I don't care about who they are. The problem is especially if you start to do this healing process, if that's been your go-to, that is a trauma response. You have learned that to feel your emotions is unsafe. You have learned that maybe people may use your emotions against you, that it may stop you from being able to make quick decisions, that you feel very alone when you feel those things. And you might have been in very much rescue and provider mode for yourself and for other people, especially if you're listening to this as a co-parent, to where you've never had a space to rest and feel all of your emotions. So for your healing process to fully take effect, it's going to require you to feel those emotions. Because what happens is if I'm someone who is so detached from what I need and what I feel, I'm going to keep attracting people who are not attached to what I need and what I feel. So I keep wanting to meet people who give a care about what I need, who are vulnerable with me, who are sacrificial who compromise, who care about comforting me, but I don't know how to even give that to myself. I don't have access to what that looks like. So I'm saying this top of mind or at the very top, because even if this is something that you're like, fine, good, I can definitely not care about this person. They are a non-factor in my life. As you start to heal your body and heal your heart, you're going to have more access to your emotions. 
You're going to start feeling more access to rage, to sadness, to betrayal, not only with this previous partner, but maybe from so many other traumas and experiences that have been repressed and stored in your body that you haven't felt safe to experience yet. And this is no matter how old you are, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I've helped women up until their 70s. I think it's been my oldest client. I want to say at least 69, but I'm pretty sure she was in her 70s. So yeah, you don't outgrow the fact that you've always needed a safe space to feel, okay? So that's why everything that I'm going to share after this is so important for you to keep in mind because this is all going to hopefully circle back to where when this person says or does something, when they continue to drop the ball the way that they've done before, if they say an indirect insult to you, if they drop the ball when it comes to something that happens with your child, if they flaunt their new person in front of you and it's someone that you don't like, if they withhold information from you, if they withhold money and resources from you, you want to get to a place to where no matter what they do cannot trigger you because the way that you see what they're doing is more about them than about you. This is not to say that the ways that they are acting does not have direct impact on you. And for there to be some frustration there or that there may be things that you need to solve now because of the hiccups that they are causing. But as far as your own emotional clarity, I've said this before, but I've said this in other contexts and hopefully this helps. And for those of you who don't know, I'm also a co-parent. So just know that I'm not talking up my butt here. <laughs> I am I, I'm speaking from some experience of where you kind of have to get to when you are sharing the rearing of someone that you are no longer in relationship with. And this is even for those of us who have really great relationships with our co-parents. You know, people are people. And even when y'all have a great friendship or a great communication style, sometimes they can say or do things that is going to rub you the wrong way. And so I've said in other contexts that the opposite of love is not hate. It is neutrality. It's when someone can walk into the room and I, I don't really feel anything with the fact that they're there. I don't really feel anything with whether or not they decide to talk to me or who they're talking to. You know, they could be a curtain on the wall. If they walk next to me, I can greet them and I really don't feel anything. There's nothing but, there's not even the need for forgiveness there because it's over. It's gone. You know, like it, that, that is, that is true emotional freedom. And that's where I want every single person who has had to co-parent with someone who in the past has been triggering, toxic, or unhelpful to them. I want you to get to that place of freedom so that you no longer have to carry any of that stress in your body and in your mind. Okay? So here are some steps to hopefully help you get there. So the first tip that I'm going to give you is to see this person as a coworker. See this relationship as a co-working relationship. This is no longer your former partner, your former wife, your former husband, your former girlfriend, your former boyfriend, your former lover. This is, if you can make up, if you have to make up a character in your mind and say, I'm working with John at Costco. Like you, you, and you don't work at Costco, but you, I'm, I am acting, I'm playing make believe that this is John at Costco. John at Costco is asking me when our coworker Sam, which is our child, needs to be at the doctor, right? And so let me kind of backtrack a little bit. There is something about, and this is going to vary depending on everyone's emotional, like maturity or emotional healing or trauma, where your triggers are, your own personality style. But for the most part, I've seen that it is a lot easier for us to have more detachment around coworkers that annoy us and piss us off. And for us to go into straight business mode with, you know, John and marketing, who I can't stand his laugh and I can't stand, he's always talking and over talking people and thinks he knows everything and he can't ever say I'm sorry. And then he's trying to bogart what's happening and take credit for stuff. I can't stand John, but I got to work with John. So I decide to remove all my energy, all my give a cares towards John. And I'm only going to talk to him very matter-of-factly about what I need to talk to him about, when I need to talk to him about it. And anytime he does any of that other bull crap that pisses me off and annoys me, I expect it. And so because I expect it and because I've decided to not engage in that because I don't get paid to engage with that and I'm, I don't get paid to try to change him, all I need to do is I need these deliverables, I need this file, I need this email. 
and everything else, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less, John, if you don't like the fact that I'm asking for this email, we got to do it. So now what? And I'm going to let you have your tantrum. I'm going to let you go and talk your mess to the other coworkers because that does not affect me. And also, you're not going to get my peace. I come here. I come here to go to work. I come here to get my check. I come here to do my job. And I'll leave because my real life is outside of work. My job is not my life. My job does not define me. My job does not give me anything other than the money I need to go and find my pleasure, my fun, my friends outside of here. And it might even be funding me starting my own little side hustle and business on the side. This is just where I clock in, but this is not my whole totality. Does that make sense? So when John is acting up, John, you're a non-factor, but I'm only going to deal with you because I need to, because it's going to help me have the rest of my life under control. When we are going into no contact with a former partner, that is hard for us to get to that place. I think many of you, even if that was hard at first, you, you tracked where I was going with that, right? And you were like, yeah, I, I, I get that. And I could do that, right? That is hard to do. Because we may say, okay, I'm no longer in relationship with this person, but we have months, years, decades for some of us of this person pissing us off, knowing exactly what it is that we need and that we wanted and not giving it to us, maybe lying to us. Again, maybe there was infidelity. Maybe there was some triangulation. Maybe they were very good at pushing our buttons and saying things that really got under our skin. And so, yes, I know I'm no longer in a relationship with you, but when you do all these things that are obvious and not so obvious, right? When you say something, you're answering my question, but you're answering in a certain tone of voice. So when you answered the questions in a tone of voice that was similar in the past, it meant that you were about to say something slick. It meant that you were about to start an argument. It meant that you might've been hiding information from me. And so it gets very easy to get emotionally invested in what this person is doing because you're still emotionally tied to them. So my suggestion would be for you to somehow, in some way, going back to my original example, could make this person, I thought I started off saying John at Costco, but imagine this person is now John at marketing. John at marketing has this really annoying set of habits that I do not like. I know that John sometimes lies. I know that John sometimes is not going to do what he says he's going to do. I know that John has portions of group projects that he's supposed to do, and sometimes he's not going to do it. So if I know that that's who John is, and I've already gone to supervisors, I've already sent the emails, HR already knows, the managers are on my side and they know, yeah, that's some bullshit, but unfortunately he performs well in these other areas, you know, we'll have a talk with him, all that stuff. So I know that John is here and John is here to stay. I've already done everything I can to try to get him out. I've tried to talk to him and tell him what I need him to do. John is going to be John from here on out. So now that I understand that this is who John is, how do I make sure I do my job in a way that John's foolishness and his irresponsibility is not going to affect me? That John's attitude, that John's slick mouth, that John's way of trying to bring me into office gossip and make me feel some kind of way. Some of you, it may be that this person, the way that metaphor translates is that they're, the example I said before about they're waving around new partners and, you know, even if you couldn't care less about who the partner is, they're doing it in a way to try to make you feel jealous or make you feel some kind of way or try to replace you, right? So I know John is going to be on this bullshit. So knowing this is the type of bullshit that John is on, how do I make sure that I do my job in a way that I don't have to engage in what he does? I already have safeguards in place and I'm going to do what I need to do and let John have the emotion that he has. One way that that looks like, I know I've already said it, but just in case it was lost in the explanation is you have to stop fighting and trying to get someone to change. If John is an annoying son of a gun and he tells really bad corny jokes that are ill-timed, if I have a reaction every time he tells this corny joke, this really ill-timed joke, then I'm going to be pissed off all the time versus if John tells a joke and I'm just neutral, I'm flat face. You're not going to get any energy from me because it wasn't funny and I don't care. Where's the folder? Where's the file? Okay, thank you. So now let's talk about this in a co-parenting context. I'm trying to talk with my co-parent about something that's going on with my child and he's trying to engage in conversations that are not related to the child, whether or not it's their own private relationship whether or not it's things that have happened in our relationship in the past, they're trying to engage. And so I'm like, you know what, Marcus, I need to know what's going on with Sasha. Is Sasha going to be there after school today at four? 
Yeah, well, I just I just need to to find this out. Marcus, I got to go. So is she going to be there at four? Man, why can't we just talk? Okay, Marcus, I'm going to maybe have to text you if we can't figure this out. So I need to know, is she going to be there at four? Yeah, she'll be there at four, but I can't talk to you about it. All right, thank you, Marcus. I will talk to you later. And that might not be the exact role play that you may want to do as far as interrupting and cutting them off. Some of you will have to do that with your folks, especially if they tend to dominate conversations and the way that they suck you in is you're trying to be a nice person and you're trying to, you know, let them get it all out so that you can say what you need to say and move on. But that's actually how they are emotionally abusive towards you. They know that you're going to let them rant at them and just dominate all your time. You got to go. You don't want to hear it. You're trying to tune it out and tell yourself, you know, this person, they are unhealthy and everything they're saying is not true. And so I'm not going to care what they say. But it doesn't matter if you're telling yourself that because all they have to do is drop those bombs and they'll walk away. And you're the one who's recounting that in your head later on. So what I tell a lot of my students and clients is if you have someone in your life, whether or not it's a co-parent, a narcissistic parent, a friend of me, ex-lover, whoever it may be. And that's kind of what they do. They corner you and they just start going off on you. And you just sit there, you kind of take it. And you think because you're sitting there, you have your head held high and you're making a face that looks like you don't really care what they're saying and that you're unbothered. You're actually taking all of that in. You are absolutely taking all of that in. That is an emotional assault on your body, on your spirit, on your mind, and literally on your body because we store stress in our body. So I tell my students, you do not let anyone rant at you. If they're saying things that you do not want to hear, it's time for you to exit. You don't need to wait for them to catch their breath to say, okay, I'm going to go. You don't need to wait for them to finish their sentence for them to say, okay, I'm going to go. You don't need to wait for them to give you permission. They're like, no, 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 you don't get to leave. I, I, I have more. You can't talk to me. You can't be an adult. I got to go. And you leave. You leave and you let them have their emotion. You let them rant behind you. You let them go off. You let them talk shit about you because what's most important is that you know who you are. And so that's another thing that is, you know, using this John metaphor, you know who you are at your job. So if John is talking shit with other people who also don't really matter to you, or maybe they did matter to you. Maybe these are other coworkers that you thought were your friends. And now John's got a hold of them and they're totally engaging in this, this side talk about you. The way that that metaphor may translate is you may have had mutual friends that started to take Marcus aside. You may have your own blood family members that are taking Marcus aside. And so at the end of the day, if you keep using all of your energy to try to get your family members and your friends, air quotes, you can't see my air quotes, to choose you or to be on your side, you are fighting a a losing battle. Because people who actually love you and are there for you and are worth you spending your emotional effort and time in You are not going to have to, you know, while you're rebuilding yourself and while you're trying to parry and while you're trying to heal yourself and heal this relationship, having to navigate the random opinions of other people who are supposed to be a part of your tribe, that does not need to be on your list. So detaching from John and all his mess is to understand that John's going to have his little echo squad. He's going to have his flunkies. He's going to have people who are just as toxic as him that are attracted to the gossip. They're going to be attracted to the mess. And I get to decide who are the people, who are the type of people that I want to align with. And just because these people have these opinions, do I get to say that what they think about me defines me, right? And you don't have to. And I know that that can be hard. That's why it's very important for you to be talking with your therapist. If you're working with me as your coach, to be talking with me about it, you know, to be talking with whoever it is that you need to, to process the hurt that happens around this and to not just keep saying, I don't really care because you do care. Going back to the intro at the top, if you have lived your whole life and your refrain is, I don't care, move on, stay strong, stay strong. The way for you to actually heal and get to the other side with relationships that are safe for you is for you to learn how to be a safe space for yourself, to feel all these feelings versus locking them down so that you don't keep getting attracted to people who also don't care about your feelings as well because you're not attached to them. And you may be afraid of them or you may be ashamed of them or you may see them as a weakness, right? And we want to have relationships with people who don't see us in that way, okay? So that's what I'm going to say about the co-working one for right now. I could obviously probably talk about that for a long period of time. 
But let's go ahead and go into the other tips and everything. And if you're one of my students at any of my programs or any of my coaching calls or town halls, I'm actually considering starting just, I did it before when I had our, our smaller BGH members club where you can come and submit a question, even if you're not in one of the bigger programs and get some support outside of one-on-one -on -one calls. So I might be bringing that back. Maybe, y'all. Maybe. So stay tuned to all the announcements and everything on social and our communities to learn about that. But I'm going to leave that there for now to get into the other tips. Hey, we hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Let's take a quick break to say thanks to this week's sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by eHarmony, the dating app to find someone you can be yourself with. In a world where you do not know what you're getting, finding someone you can be authentic with and who leads in being their real self is so important. And when you're dating, it's even more important that you meet people who aren't into wearing a mask and are just as serious about meeting their person through genuineness and clarity. And that's why I love eHarmony's detailed compatibility quiz to help you see upfront if they are a great fit for your values, your lifestyle, and your commitment level versus having to wait months in to figure all of that out. eHarmony is all about helping you find someone you can be yourself with. We all want to be seen heard, and understood. And that's why so many more people are turning to eHarmony. I'd love for you to give eHarmony a shot. Get started with their compatibility quiz for free so you can find someone you can be yourself with. eHarmony, get who gets you. Ever feel like you're too busy to eat healthy? Well, meal kits from Sunbasket are the perfect solution. I've had the amazing experience of trying Sunbasket for myself, and let me tell you, it was amazing. So at my core, I'm a meat and potatoes girl. So the steaks with chimichurri and harissa roasted sweet potatoes were hitting the spot. And they have such an incredible variety of new and flavorful dishes like the salmon burgers with lemon dill mayo and the Saigon chicken and vermicelli bowls. Y'all, they are so good. With Sun Basket, you can feel confident that you're putting a healthy and delicious meal on the table that is ready in 30 minutes or less. Sunbasket proudly works with the best farms and suppliers to fill their meal kits with organic, fresh produce and responsibly source antibiotic-free meats and seafood. Sunbasket makes it easy and convenient to cook healthy meals that cater to your lifestyle and health needs. So with delicious meal plans like Mediterranean, carb conscious, vegetarian, keto friendly, gluten free, diabetes friendly, and more. It is so easy to swap ingredients as needed as well. Ready to eat in less than five minutes with zero prep and no mess. It is perfect for even the busiest of us. So try it for four weeks and see how clean eating can change the way you feel. Go to sunbasket.com forward slash black girls heal today to save $120 across your first four deliveries. The sunbasket.com forward slash black girls heal to save $120 across your first four deliveries plus free shipping on your first order. With summer winding down and fall almost being here, it's time to think about getting our cozy self-care rituals on point. The Everything Shower is a core staple with Osea's new Andaria Algae Body Wash and is a must-have addition to your routine. The Andaria Algae Body Wash infuses your shower with the healing power of the sea with this all-natural, uplifting, citrusy scent. This pH balance and hydrating formula doesn't strip the skin, leaving it feeling soft and renewed. I love how this body wash has such a smooth gel-like texture, it lathers so easily, and leaves me feeling fresh and yummy. And its natural plant-based ingredients help support the skin's moisture barrier and cleanse without stripping, which is perfect for this time of year. With Osea being clean, vegan, cruelty-free, and climate-neutral certified, you never have to choose between your values and your best skin. Great your shower with clean, vegan face and body care from Osea. Get 10% off your first order site-wide with the code BGH at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over $60. Head to OseaMalibu.com and use code BGH for 10% off. So the second tip related to downgrading your relationship with this person to a co-working relationship is using parenting apps to only discuss the details of childcare. If I'm going into no contact with someone, which means that I am not talking with them, I'm not really spending time with them, but I still have to communicate with them about the details of our child. 
There are parenting apps that you can use that store everything from the name of your doc, the child's doctor, the size of the clothes. You can send money through there. You can limit characters. You can share calendars through there. There's a free one that's called App Close, A-P-P-C-L-O-S-E, which I think is a weird name for a parenting app. I've never looked up the origin of the name, but that's a free one that you can use. And then there are countless other parenting apps. Using a parenting app is going to be such a great container for you for a few reasons. I think one, because it's built for that, that mechanism or for that purpose. But I think going back to what I was saying before about you already have years and decades or a month's worth of baggage with this person of ingrained habits where they say something and you may reactively react or you say something and they reactively react. And I think if you are someone who has fought over text a lot or fought over phone calls a lot, changing the medium for how you communicate with them kind of communicates to your brain that I'm doing something different. So if they try to slip in a comment or something, if they try to slip in, you know, a jab, if they try to slip in a monkey wrench into your plans, but you're communicating through a new platform, a new app, I think that's going to give you a little bit of a pause before you react the same way that you did before, because you're doing something new and different. And so you're creating new norms there. I think also is very helpful because especially if your co-parent is a narcissist, maybe not a physically violent narcissist, but, you know, emotional gaslighter and everything else who will use time and breath to dominate and talk about their emotions and what they need. They will use your conversations to play the victim and say how you're not being fair or how you're not listening to them or how, you know, they're doing everything or you're not really communicating. You don't need all the fluff. All you need is to be able to say, okay, here's where I'm going to be. Here is where the child is going to be. And here are the details. And you can communicate all of that through a parenting app. You don't need to talk to them on the phone. You don't need to talk to them on FaceTime unless maybe they want to talk to the child. But even then in the parenting apps, there are FaceTime options there. So you can easily just communicate it and use that to facilitate the conversation between your child and your co-parent. All right. But keeping your conversations only to details and written form through the no contact process would be my next tip. The third tip is to set boundaries and do not engage in conversations to talk about us and their feelings towards you. So you don't need to even say why. You don't need to say I'm going to no contact process. You don't need to say, you know, what you did really hurt me because that's you actually opening the door to talk about it. You say, oh, what you did really hurt me. It gives them the opportunity. I know some of you may be in back and forth with people who are clearly people that you are done with. Like you would be happy to never talk to them again. For some of you, there are people who you're done with, but also you are very susceptible to their sweet talk. You're very susceptible to their apologies. They know exactly what to say to get you to kind of reconsider and think that they are going to be different this time around. So if you open up with, I felt very hurt, then it gives them the best window to come in and say, you know, that wasn't really my intention. And I get that. And to say all the things that feel really validating and start to plant seeds to get you back into the cycle. Okay, so if you are trying to ask about what size Johnny wears because he needs some new shoes, then and he starts to say, well, you know, I wanted to talk to you about us a little bit because I was thinking about the last conversation we had. Hey, Tony, I don't really have time to talk about that, that right now. Can you please just tell me about what shoe size he wears? You know, and as a mom, I don't know. You're going to know what shoe size he wears. I'm just pulling out examples. But, you know, and so. If or when they start to try to push you to have a conversation either by phone or via text to just say, hey, not a place to talk about that. And thanks for understanding that. If the person is not a narcissist, if the person is a narcissist, you may want to not really engage at all with it, depending on the type of narcissist that they are. You could just reinforce what you already said before as far as thank you so much for this information and maybe I don't know. Actually, I don't want to give that feedback about what to say to a narcissist here because there are so many different variations for how they may respond and maybe try to manipulate through text. I would just really not engage at all outside of the details. There's something called an extinction burst that I don't know if I've talked about in a while here. So anytime that you are starting to change your own behavior cycle, especially with people who are dysfunctional and toxic, they're going to engage in something called an extinction burst. So it takes 
two people to be a part of a dysfunctional cycle. As long as one person is changing the dysfunctional cycle, then the other person has no choice other than to pivot because you're no longer engaging. The buttons that they are pushing, you are no longer allowing it to be pushed. One of the methods that people talk about when it comes to dealing with folks, especially who are narcissists, is the gray rock method. So if they're trying to say something to give you jabs, to try to pressure buttons to get you to react emotionally or to say something, you just pretend to be like a gray rock. And so you don't really complain about it. You don't really push back about it. You don't really fight them about it. That's not the, that's not me saying for you to stay in the room and take it. I'm saying that whenever they try to get a rise out of you, you remove yourself from the situation and you don't really give them that feedback. You don't really give them that energy. And you can Google gray rock method to learn more about that. When it comes to extinction bursts, the example I always use is I used to do counseling for parents and especially parents who had maybe kids who were struggling with listening, following instructions. You know, they're rebelling because of a lot of different reasons. Maybe there was dysfunction and trauma in the family. Maybe they were depressed. Maybe there was anxiety. But whatever it is, the child was rebelling. And so one of the things that we would talk about with the parents is, okay, we're going to change your rules and structures. We're going to give you some more boundaries. We're going to change how you're communicating with your child. And it's all going to be healthier and better structure-wise, but your child is not going to fall into place. If anything, your child is going to rebel more. They are going to push back at these new rules, guidelines, even your positive communication style because they are used to what used to happen before because they could be dysfunctional in this dysfunctional cycle. So they're going to push and escalate to try to get you to fall back into what you did earlier. And so they're going to keep going, keep going until eventually the behavior stops. And that's what's called the extinction burst. Because then they realize that, okay, no, this is not just a phase. This is not just for a moment. This is actually how it is. And then they will fall in line with what the new normal is. And I think what happens is sometimes we will try to do a new habit or behavior with people who are toxic in our life. And when they don't take to it or when they keep pushing us or when they keep trying to egg us on, we will fall back into going off on them, getting upset, hang about it, getting mad at them, threatening them going into a back and forth about them. For some of us who are still trying to figure this out, maybe even we fall into trying to use the children against them the way that they try to use the child against us, right? Like we will get right back into the mess with them. And so you have to hold on. You have to hold on to your new boundaries. You have to hold on to your new normal and not allow them to get you to engage. And it is so very hard. So when it happens, I'm not going to say if it happens, When it happens, because you have been a part of this dysfunctional cycle for months, for years, for decades yourself, this is going to be you developing new habits and you're not going to be perfect at it. You're absolutely not going to be perfect at it because you're a human, because you have feelings, because you have trauma, because there are real hurts that happen, because the ways that they are going to be acting and talking and not showing up the way that they need to, not being a responsible parent, maybe it may be breaking the heart of the children because they're trying to either get at you or they're just negligent in some ways. And so the children are affected. And as you're as a good parent, you're upset on behalf of the children. And so you're not going to react, you know, 100 percent neutrally all the time and nor should you. Right. But however you're reacting, if after you react, you realize, you know what, this is not what I wanted to do. And next time I will want to do something else. You have to meet yourself with some compassion. You have to meet yourself with some forgiveness, with some understanding, with some validation, and just saying, this is really, really hard. And I'm still figuring this out. I'm figuring this out for the first time. These are all, this is a new way of me doing it. I guess I'm learning how to be a different person. I'm learning how to remove myself from the situation. And so it's going to take me figuring out what works for me. And that's okay. And I love myself and I know I'm doing my best and I know I'm going to continue to do my best. So if you need to write something like that down so that you can say it to yourself every time you need to, every day, over and over, especially when you're not triggered, it's best for you to do these types of validation and inner child affirmations and stuff when you are completely neutral and not in a triggering situation because one, you're not going to remember it. If you're at a 10, your brain just shuts down. Again, even if you're not someone who yells or goes off or gets really aggressive, if you are emotionally flooded with sadness, with hurt, with disappointment, your brain will still shut down in the same way, even though it's in a more internal response. And so if you are every day giving yourself new programming and new narratives around, you know, you 
you deserve to have some peace and you deserve to allow yourself to go slow and to figure out what works for you, what doesn't work for you, that's going to be more helpful for you than not. Okay. All righty. Step number four. It is okay to be the bad guy. Tip number four is if you're doing no contact with someone that you are co-parenting with and you're having to change all these boundaries and you're having to change how you communicate with them and you're not you know, they're asking you a question and you're always used to giving them a full answer and giving a whole lot of words and giving a lot of explanations and trying to be a good communicator. So now doing no contact and it feels like a complete 180 from what you used to do before or you now having boundaries is equal to them with you being a bitch or you not being a good team player or you being the reason why all this went wrong or whatever it is, you not respecting them, whatever it may be. You have to be okay with you being the bad guy in their eyes and also in the eyes of other people because you are making the best decisions for yourself and for your children in the long term. And so in the long term, you know that this dysfunctional cycle cannot work. You've accepted that I cannot change this other person. It's also, it's not my job to change my co-parent. It's not my job to get them to see the error of their ways and to apologize and to be more involved. It'd be great if that happened. It'd be great if they had a moment where the clouds parted, you know, God spoke to them and said, you need to get your shit together. We would love for that to happen, but that is not your job. And you have retired that from being your job. Your job is for you to be the best person, for you to be the best parent, for you to be the safe space for your children. And that involves you emotionally detaching from all their tomfoolery. Stop trying to change another wrong person and focus on the only person that you can change, which is yourself. And by you changing and engaging yourself, that's where you can find your own peace. You can find your own self-validation. When this person or other people around you, they have gathered their own cronies of people, their own cores of people that try to tell you that you're not good enough or you're the problem, whatever, you're creating a safe space within yourself with your own tribe. Hopefully you're also detaching from them as well, that you're no longer engaging with these people as well, including if they are blood family. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, when we do the no contact process, we think it's just one person that we are going to have to distance from, but it's not. We may have ops in our own family. I cannot tell you, speaking of trauma being passed down, I cannot tell you how many women get to a place where they are in a partnership with a man, specifically men. I see this a lot with women who have been in heterosexual partnerships. They have been in a very dysfunctional relationship with the man, whether or not there's children there or not. But for this example, let's say there's children. And she's finally starting to move away. She's finally starting to you know, get back connected to her dignity, find her own peace, find her own sense of sovereignty and all that stuff. And the person who's leading the charge and telling her that she's making a mistake and that she's the problem and that she just needs to go back to this person because he's a good man, in spite of all the emotional abuse or neglect or whatever else may be happening, financial control, whatever it may be, that person is her own mother. Her own mother is the main person who's reinforcing that this trauma is normal and that this is the best you can have and that you're lucky to even have what you do have. And so that is extremely confusing one, but so hurtful and feels so, feel so much like a betrayal once your eyes are open. When your eyes are not open and you've been hearing this type of stuff your whole life, right? You ended up in this type of relationship because you watched your mother or other women in your life or other people around you have these types of traumatic, normal relationships. So when they would say things like that, it wouldn't even clock it as something that was wrong. It was just like, yeah, she's right. You know, like it's just par for the course. Now that you've been working on yourself, now that your eyes are open, you're recognizing that this is like bullshit. And then you're looking at your mother like, how could you, my mother, want me to be in this hurtful situation? And your mother was stuck in time. She's stuck in her own trauma. She's stuck in her own dysfunction. And so there may be a lots of people that you need to pull away from who are not going to get that you get to make the right decisions for you. And you don't need their permission. You don't need their forgiveness. You don't need their acceptance of it. And along the way, you will find people who get it. Even if you have to go out alone, even if you need to be the person who is villainized and scapegoated, in places that you used to be celebrated, it is not worth the ongoing trauma and abuse and neglect and physical illness on your body to be in these types of stressful situations just for people to think sometimes that you're a good person because we all know that other people's opinions are fleeting and they will fluctuate. 
The last tip that I'm going to give you when it comes to co-parenting, doing the no contact process with a co-parent is to not engage in the attempts to triangulate the kids. So if they are trying to pass messages through the children, telling your child that it is not their responsibility to pass the message, and that is going to confuse your child so much. That's going to confuse your child because one, children are not, they're not dumb. Even as young as one and two, even if they don't have the words to explain it, they feel the tension in the house. They see when somebody's eyes flits to the side because their partner says something that was hurtful. They see people's backs brace and people's hands clench. They hear the slight change in tone or the heavy change in tones. They know what your mad face looks like better than you do. They know what your sad face looks like better than you do. You know, children are very much plugged into everything that is happening. And so they may be very confused because they may want to help. They may be very confused and all over the place because they don't want to get in trouble with the other parent and they don't pass on the message because maybe they may get blamed because you told them to not pass on the message to them. They may be really confused about why can't y'all just talk to begin with. Like if maybe they have been kind of kept out of the, the couple discord. It may be very confusing for them. So in those places, in that case, it's going to be very important for you to follow up with you know, the things that mommy and daddy need to talk to, talk about, or mommy and mommy need to talk about is between us. And this might be a lot of information for you to share. There's a lot for you to remember. And so I don't want you to have that pressure, okay? And I know you want to do the right thing and make your mommy happy or make your daddy happy if they want to send a message, but I'm going to talk to them and say that this is going to be best for them to talk to me about because I don't want you to feel like you have to remember all that information. So don't worry about that and just know that mommy will take care of it, okay? And so it's very important, y'all, to reassure your children and remind them that they're safe. You'll notice that I gave some details there. I gave just enough without putting them completely in the middle and saying, you know, your daddy's always trying to use you against me and all that stuff, or your mommy's always trying to make it seem like I'm not doing good enough. That is emotional stress on the children. They don't need that. Think about it this way. This situation is stressful enough for you as a person, a grown adult person who's in it. Now, what is a six-year-old, seven-year-old going to do with all that information? And so in a situation that they can't control with two parents that they love, and they are now also in the middle of that, right? But I also gave a few details because, like I said at the beginning, children are not dumb. They know that there's something that's up. So you need to be able to talk to each of these components to reassure them and comfort them and also to remind them that they're protected and that they're covered. Now, I use a, a smaller voice, a, a softer voice. You know, it's obviously, hopefully, obviously, talking to children that are more infant or toddler age or maybe even school age. And so if you start to have, if you have tweens or teenagers, there may be a few more words that you want to use. You might want to say, I can't remember how I said it in the original example, but you might want to say directly, I don't want you to be put in the middle of all this, you know, and to teens and teenagers, appreciate you more when you talk to them like they have some common sense. The more you try to act as if everything's okay, everything's, everything's okay, they're going to feel like it's bullshit. Like they really appreciate being respected in that way. But also at the same time, they're still children. As much as they think they're grown and that they can take all the information, that's still their parents. There's still things that they can't really solve or deal with. You know, some of you who have been in this situation, you may have had your children who you thought you were protecting or shielding or just trying to keep everything quiet. And maybe one day your teen came to you and said, Mom, I don't know why you're dealing with this. I don't know why you're taking this type of abuse. You deserve better, right? You, you don't need all this. Like your children know exactly what's going on. And so meeting them where they are, also remembering that this is their parent. So even if they're talking mess about them, be very, very mindful because that might be, not might be, that's kind of a trap and it's not an intentional trap, but your children remember every single word that you said. And so even if they're talking mess about one parent, the other parent is still theirs. And so if you join in with talking mess about them, then, you know, teenagers especially, their feelings about everybody changes minute by minute. You know, their emotional consistency is very similar to toddlers, right? I love you one minute. I hate you the next. I want to do it by myself. You're my best friend and I need you and never leave me. It's up and down. 
And so you want to make sure that you stay static and you stay neutral and you stay consistent in where you need to be because later on, whatever you say, they're going to remember and it might affect their relationship with their parent. It may affect whether or not they feel like they can confide in you and talk to you about the things that they're feeling about the other parent. So you want to make sure that you stay a safe and neutral place. Okay. There are so many books that talk about co-parenting that talk about what does this look like? Exactly what I'm talking about when how to deal with examples of triangulation, how to communicate to your children, how to keep them safe. So I would really encourage you that anything that I've shared here, actually this whole episode, but especially this, that you go to your local bookstore, go on Amazon, go to Barnes and Nobles, wherever it may be, and find some resources to help you in this new normal, in this new dynamic, so that you can have some more skills and tools to help you. This episode was specifically about no contact. If I'm doing no contact, then if my co-parent is trying to communicate with me through my children, don't allow that to happen, okay? Send a text, send whatever messenger that you need to at the drop-off, say, please do not tell ex-child to communicate this to me. If you need to tell something to me, please only tell it to me through the phone or through text. Otherwise, I'm not going to respond to it. If you send anything else through child number one, two, or three, just consider that message was not received because I am not going to reinforce the children being put in the middle of this, right? And then you have to live by it. You have to not engage with whatever has been communicated through the children because they will test you. In the same way that I talked about the extinction burst, they're used to you backing down. They're used to you kind of maybe speaking emotionally sometimes. And so you have to follow through with your boundaries, okay? And I feel pretty confident saying that in this context too, because usually we only go into no contact with people who are either struggling with respecting our boundaries or we struggle with our boundaries within ourselves. And so either way, this is a lesson for you to figure out what it is that you want and what you want it to look like, okay? All right, so that is a lot, y'all. I hope that you found this helpful. Please share this with anyone that you feel like may need it. Feel free to bookmark it and re-listen to it as much as you need to. If you want more support with the actual no contact process, you can learn about the no contact process by joining our no contact and detox support kit. And it really breaks it down in super easy ways. And the women who have participated really, really enjoy it and have been loving it. So you can join by going to blackgirlsheal.org slash no contact. And get your life back, get your sanity back, get your life back and get clarity. Okay, so that's it for now. I'm sending you all so much love. And as always, I will see you in our next episode. Take care of yourselves. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Before we get started, let's take a small break to say thank you to this week's sponsors. 